thank you so much for the introduction and also for this great session. And I feel a bit disabled right now. Can anybody hear me? So, okay, that's good. I feel a bit disabled right now because I miss my pointer. But uh, <laughs> luckily, we have this wooden prosthesis. So, um, this means that I'm able to adapt to my physical needs. So, and this would have also <laughs> been done by people with disabilities in the past. So, thank you. So, I'm very happy to use this particular case study of this... Um, femoral amputation that was observed in a uh, medieval young adult female from the community of Morsel, which, was, um, which is situated in Belgium. And this particular case study hopefully will help us um, to assist in interpretation of um, disability in the past. And we can use a few, we can ask ourselves a few questions about healthcare by the combination of osteological evidence, for instance, also by using funerary data, as well as um, knowledge about surgical interventions and uh, medical treatment. And we can also ask ourselves, or we can ask questions like, how will they adapt to their physical needs, uh, for example, by the aid of uh, crutches or other um, instruments. And I will also use evidence of other healed limb amputations, uh, mainly seen in the late medieval archaeological records. And this to hopefully describe the reasons uh, for an amputation, because of course many people did not survive such a traumatic experience, especially before the introduction of modern techniques, such as flap techniques, or uh, before the introduction of anesthesia. So this is a particular case study, and Morsel is here, it's, now I can use this, is in, uh, situated in the province of East Flanders, and it was actually, apart from the cultivation of rye and oats, it was mainly an important center for the cultivation of flax and the production of linen, which was also specifically in the provinces of West Flanders and East Flanders, one of the main important economic activities uh, for Flanders during the late Middle Ages and beyond. Um, probate inventories, um, they demonstrated that many families in Morsel owned a spinning wheel as a kind of additional income. And here, this is our case study. Morphological traits of the pelvic bone indicated a most likely female individual and aging was done also by morphological characteristics um, used for aging techniques such as uh, the auricular surface and um, indicated an age between 19 and 25 years old. Apart from the amputated right femur, I didn't find any other evidence uh, of trauma or degenerative joint disease or infections. Here I do have a map of the churchyard the skeletons are very little, I know, <laughs> they're not very big, but luckily the arrow is a bit bigger, so I don't have, <laughs> even have to use my wooden aid right now. So, she was buried at the edge of a row. Um, does this demonstrate or indicate differential burial treatments? Probably not, because I looked at other individuals who were buried at the margin of the churchyard or at the edge of a row, and they were mainly old adults with no signs of infections or with no signs of trauma apart from degenerative joint diseases. Um, this is the St. Martin Church and um, the excavations revealed more than 100 burials, mainly from the medieval and post-medieval era. And the medieval burials, they were also clustered around the chapel, which is not pictured, but it was here. Has, luckily it's long enough, <laughs> nobody was over here. Um, it was the chapel, the St. Budula Chapel. So I also want to take a closer look at the osteological evidence, and this is the amputated right femur. We don't know how long she survived after the amputation took place, because we can see um, osteophytic formation or bone exostosis that obscures the cut marks. But what is clear, it is that the stump got infected. 
And this was um, often the case after an amputation, even after the introduction of antibiotics in the 19th century. So many people died because of this infection. And it's demonstrated by the formation of the large cloaca. This is caused by osteomyelitis or a non-specific infection running through the bloodstream. So it is quite likely that pus must have drained out from the end of the stump for a certain amount of time. And I also wanted to take a look, um, I took some CT scans as well. And before that, I found another case study of um, a young adult individual who got an amputation at the age of nine. And 14 years later, at the age of 23, <coughs> her stump got infected and she was in need of a second amputation. And um, because of this pus that has drained out from the end of the stump, this, made imp this might imply a chronic stable osteomyelitis. I derived some osteometric data, for example, um, from the subtrochanteric area. So I took uh, measurements of the medial lateral diameter and anterior posterior diameter of both. Uh, this is the amputated right femur, and this is the healthy left. And all measurements were smaller compared to the healthy left one. And this is possibly due to a reduction in locomotion in the affected limb, as well as a decrease in mechanical loading. And it's called disuse osteopenia. So it's a loss of bone density. And this also implies um, a long-term immobilization of the affected limb. These are CT scans, and here we can see a dense substance located in the medulla. It's not confirmed whether this is pathological or not, because the cortex seems quite normal, as well as the delineation. But it's more evident here, in the distal end, so we can see involucrum, which is actually new periosteal bone growth, and this is caused by tearing of the periosteum by the intensification of pus. So I collected evidence, I mean, based on Mace um, has collected some evidence of yield limb amputations in his paper published in 96. And um, he used um, evidence from a wide range of geographical locations as well as time periods. So and I collected specifically evidence from the late Middle Ages and also added a few new case studies. For example, there is a battlefield in Portugal and they revealed um, two adults with amputated um, limbs. And this demonstrates that even soldiers with an amputation, they were even forced or able to participate in warfare. <laughs> Another case study here is located in Switzerland and shows uh, two monks with an amputated left foot and this might be caused by diabetes. So, as you can see, there are more males actually um, affected or observed with amputations. And this might be due to the reasons for an amputation. And those reasons actually are usually categorized into three broad groups. And the first one is judicial punishment, which was often observed by the amputation of the foot or the hands. And when women were punished, it was either done by um, drowning or burning. So that might be a reason because more males are observed with um, amputations. Another category is a surgical intervention because of a congenital disorder or because of a trauma or because of an infection disease. And the third group is a blade injury or a violent injury and it's mostly war related. So what might be the reason for the amputation in our case study? Probably surgical intervention. Because of a trauma, it is demonstrated that usually farmers are more prone to uh, traumatic injuries. It might have been because of a trauma um, of the pop little artery, which is located here on the posterior side of the tibia. Another reason might be leprosy. But I couldn't find any evidence in the hand bones or in any other individual from the morsel community that might be related to leprosy. But another third reason, and that was also suggested to be the cause um, in the Swiss monks, might be ergotism, 
I'm not sure if anyone here has heard of ergotism. No one? Yes? Okay. <laughs> well, ergotism was widely common and endemic in Flanders, and it was even historically reported in the area of Morsel, and also in the Netherlands and in France. And this is uh, caused by the consumption of contaminated rye. So it shows here, this is barley, the left picture, and it is caused by a fungus, it's called claviceps cupulea, it's over here. And what happens after the consumption of contaminated rye is that it mostly affects the nervous system. So people started to behave um, irrationally or they started to hallucinate. But these are lesions we can't identify in skeletal remains. But sometimes it affected the lower limbs by cutting off the blood supply. So that means that it often resulted in gangrene. So an amputation was necessary. This picture here shows, uh, is a picture actually from a Flemish painter. It's painted by uh, Peter Bruegel the Elder. It's called uh, Crippled and Beggars. And it may depict um, victims of this um, ergotism, this infectious disease. It's also called St. Anthony's Fire, and this relates to a group of monks from the St. Anthony order, and they often took care of those patients. And the fire relates to this burning sensation that was felt in the lower limbs of the patients. So here, of course, they have wooden tools as well. <laughs> so, <okay. laughs> and also these uh, prosthetics uh, and uh, crutches. So unfortunately, wood doesn't preserve pretty well in the archaeological records unless it's mummified or unless it's underwater. So how can we demonstrate the likelihood of an underarm crutch is by looking at intestinal changes, for example, or um, musculoskeletal stress markers. And this was uh, observed in the right humerus, and it shows more robusticity compared to the left one. And as also indicated in a study by Knussel, who was here this morning, Christopher, but he has a double booking, <laughs> unfortunately, so, um, and Gogol, and uh, they found similar osseous alterations seen in the right arm. Um, it was observed in a medieval leprous adult male uh, from Chichester, and he was also observed with a traumatic injury in the right limb, no amputation. So, and it's also actually specifically in the deltoid muscle, and they did some EMG scans, and it seems that those muscles are pretty active when you use a crutch uh, to move the crutch forwards. What about uh, lower limb prosthesis? There was no evidence for the use of a lower limb prosthesis in this case study, but it doesn't mean it wasn't used, because uh, we do have evidence uh, dating to the classical Rome and dating to classical Greece as well, and the oldest uh, known evidence for a um, lower limb was found in the grave in Italy. And this one at the right here, it was actually wood um, with a bronze cover and was found in the grave yes, dating to 300 BC. So, but the oldest prosthetic device that was ever found was a wooden toe and it was found in the burial uh, from ancient Egypt. Um, so it was in the, the priest's daughter burial uh, dating to 1000 BC uh, found in Luxor. So it was uh, pretty well preserved. But also the early medieval records show some evidence for prosthesis. For example, the iron ring over there was found in a high status uh, burial in Austria. And it was found in situ on the place where the foot bones should have been. And this uh, suggested uh, for stabilizing the wooden foot prosthesis. So as I said before, Amputations were very uh, traumatic, was a very traumatic experience for patients, uh, a very horrific experience as well, especially before the introduction of anesthetics in the 19th century. So what did they do to alleviate the pain? It was usually a mixture of plants with sedative properties, opium and alcohol. And by the 15th century, they usually, a uh, common procedure they used during amputations was a mixture of mandragora or mandrake, black uh, henbane that's in the middle, and this was also widely used in Islamic countries in Europe and in Asia, and opium. So it's needless to say that many patients, they had a good sleep, but unfortunately many failed to wake up as well. Mm -hmm. So 
and I don't have any evidence uh, for a doctor in the late medieval period in Mosul. The earliest evidence I could find for a med medical practitioner dates to the beginning of the 18th century, and it was likely a non-academic surgeon. So if patients needed to go to a doctor, they had to go to the nearby town of Alst, which was about three miles away. So about one hour walking distance, if you were able to walk. So I would like to um, finish or conclude with some final remarks. Of course, we need to be careful when we use our skeletal data to interpret healthcare, because of course, each person reacts individually during the healing process or shows a variation uh, during the healing process. And we don't know actually how people or impaired people dealt with their ailments or with his or her impairments. Um, so also, it, what I wanted to say is as well, I wanted to um, relate to this paper by Irina Metzler, who is an historian and not an archaeologist, and she demonstrated that even disabled women were able to participate in social economic activities, for example, in textile workshops. And if we consider the nature of our community, of the Morsel community, it may be possible that she was still able to participate in preparations of the spinning process. And also, Morsel was a very Catholic and um, Christian community and, and rooted in this deep Christian tradition. And if we can consider, for instance, um, altruism or showing care, so it possibly it might be possible that she, of course, was taken care of by the family because she survived this amputation. So if people must have fit her, People must have, of course, taken care of her. So um, if we can all consider this broader framework or all these different agencies, for example, the historical text, as well as the osteological evidence and the funerary data. So, of course, we may be able to interpret this data and see this as a kind of assistance in interpreting data for uh, people with disabilities in the past. And I would like to thank, uh, of course, the session organizers and some other people from Belgium who helped me with the pictures and the museums in London <laughs> for the additional information. And these are the references. Thank you.